Okay, so I hope everyone is uh, alert and awake still. Uh, I'll go through some MCQs. Uh, so I hope my screen is visible, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so whoever wants to answer can just type in that uh, chat box so that there is, uh, you know, no uh, chaos. So we'll start with uh, this X-ray. So this is a chest and abdomen AP view of a newborn baby. I want to know the diagnosis. What sign is seen? If somebody can name that sign and risk factors and management. So I'll give one around one minute for you people to type so that there is some interaction. Hmm? So I can see some answers for the diagnosis part. Very good. So this you can see here, no, clearly is the air under the diaphragm. So this baby has had some sort of perforation where uh, air has sort of leaked in the peritoneum. This sign is called as football sign. And risk factors, can you type one or two risk factors for this? Um, Correct. So prematurity is a risk factor, use of uh, steroids along with indomethacin, uh, you know, so this is basically any, any uh, SIP or it could be a bad NEC. Uh, so perinatal asphyxia, hypoxia can also cause this. Hmm? Management immediately is to just drain the free air. Hmm? Okay. So let us go to the next question. So this is a MRI. Uh, Y'all can all uh, have a look at the different uh, images. And my questions are, what is the diagnosis? How can you make an early diagnosis and common presentation? How would a baby with this sort of MRI present clinically? Okay, just keep typing. I want more interaction so that even if it is wrong, it is okay. You know, it is good for uh, discussing. So this is a newborn baby MRI, right? And what you can see here, the a bright area no, in this uh, left side. So this is a left MCA infarct. So it is a perinatal stroke. So that is correct, perinatal stroke. But the distribution is very typical. So it is a left middle cerebral artery infarct. So that is the diagnosis or a perinatal stroke. What sequence is used for early diagnosis? I think some people have already answered that it is a diffusion weighted imaging. So that will pick up early within, uh, you know, the first few days. Later on, a T2 image is uh, more predictive. And how does a stroke present in a newborn period? What is the commonest presentation of stroke? I can see somebody writing seizures, hypotonia. So hemiparesis will not occur in the newborn period when the baby is newly born hmm? or a neonatal stroke. Seizures can occur. Many times it is very, uh, the presentation is very mild. So the baby is present with poor suck, poor feeding, you know, so the symptoms are not as uh, bright or as severe as the MRI. So seizures, poor suck, poor feeding are, and maybe a little bit of lethargy is the commonest uh, symptom initially. So hemiparesis or, you know, noticeable hemiparesis appears later. So who can answer this? Who has seen this equipment? So the first question is just uh, the identify the 
equipment. Second is to tell me the principle, how does it work? And third is the role in NICU. So in the NICU, do you use it or what is the main advantage? Where have you read about this or in which uh, chapter of your book have you read about this? Correct. So this basically comes in NRP, right? So this is usually, this is a, I think people have answered correctly. This is a based on a calorimetric capnometry. So this is a change. Uh, it's a, you know, a very handy device that sort of changes color you know, from purple to yellow or purple to golden. So uh, as to detect whether the ET tube during resuscitation has been placed properly or not. Uh, this device is a little, uh, you know, it is not a very friendly device. Like if it is kept outside exposed to air, it gets uh, spoiled. It doesn't work. It, uh, you know, doesn't change color frequently if it is so, and it is costly. So we don't use it routinely here in the Indian scenario. We still rely on air entry, chest tries, all the other things. But in Western world, this is a very standard thing in NRP. Whenever there is a resuscitation, moment the baby is intubated, the respiratory therapist will attach this. And you will see cycling or change of color. You know, gold is good. So gold means that if the purple color changes from purple to gold or yellow means the tube is in. So the principle is calorimetric capnography. This uh, next image, uh, again, what is the finding? And this is basically a 32 week uh, baby and this is a, uh, on the ultrasound, this finding has come. So identify the finding and how do you react? Very good. I can see some answers. Uh, and what do you do for this? Okay, so basically, what is this? Number one question is that what blood vessel are we, you know, doing? So this is a, obviously a Doppler. So people who have used the ultrasound machine, they can see this line, no? And at this level, they are checking the Doppler. So which vessel is this? Is it the uterine artery, umbilical artery or uh, ductus venosus? What is the vessel? Correct, umbilical artery. No? So basically, generally, uh, like we discussed a little bit in the previous case, uterine artery is used at 18, 20 weeks to you know predict PIH, IUGR sort of a status. Once IUGR or you know high risk is detected, then umbilical artery dopplers are serially done. This uh, flow that you can see, the positive flow is the systolic flow. Generally during diastole also there is a positive flow. So this diastolic flow should also be lower than the systolic peak, but still positive. As the Doppler changes get uh, bad during this diastole, which is at this point, there is absent flow. So that is called AEDS. This particular figure that I have shown, you can see a negative flow. No? So that is a reversed flow. So this is REDF or reversed end diastolic flow. You can see here, 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 these small negative deflections in this flow is a reversal of flow. So this is a reversed uh, umbilical artery flow in a Doppler. Plan of action depends on two things. One is your Doppler finding. Second is the baby's gestation. So with the same Doppler, which is abnormal, uh, with a reverse flow, there will be a different reaction if the baby is at 28 weeks, 26 weeks, 30, 32 weeks. And so the commonly followed protocol I think you all should read up once the Barcelona protocol or even the IAP has come up with standard treatment guidelines for that. So generally, reverse flow of umbilical artery is uh, considered quite severe. Ductus venosus is even one stage more severe than this. You know, so at 32 weeks, 
basically with reversal of flow you would give steroids and deliver so there is not much scope for waiting because the survival at 32 weeks is reasonable so let's go through the protocol either by iap or there is a figo guideline the federation international of gynecologists and obstetricians they have published a, a recent review in 2022 which is really downloadable so they are sort of overlapping but i think uh, just read any one guideline and uh, stick to that so this next question again uh, it is easy so i think everybody should be able to identify this plot what is it you know and what is it used to assess what is x axis y axis So uh, write the answers to the other questions also. So somebody can type the answer to the second question. What is the x-axis in this curve? What is the y-axis in this curve? And then uh, the third question is again easy, no? Which is the best test amongst the four that I have described? So, test A, test B, test C, test D. Which is the most accurate test? So I can see test A is best. Okay. So. the first question is simple part of it which is the name of the test you know so this is an roc curve receiver operator characteristics curve so what is it used to assess or what are the purposes of this test uh, of this curve so this is basically for two reasons one is to compare different tests so suppose i am comparing crp versus procalcitonin as a gold standard any other use for a particular test it can also help me find the best cut off optimal cut off so depending on how worried i am so if i am looking at a disease like cancer where i don't want to miss even a single cancer i would choose a little bit higher sensitivity as compared to specificity for a test with you know which is like a diagnostic or a specific test which i want for a confirmation i would choose that test to be more specific than sensitive so based on my cut off or you know balance between sensitivity specificity it can also help me choose the best cut off so i you know some people use a cut off of 6 for crp some people use 10 some people use 12 so those are basically the two uses number one is to compare two tests and number two is to find the optimal cut off that can help you as a clinician for that particular test x and y axis i think there are some confusing answers people have written one minus sensitivity somebody has written one minus specificity so basically uh, you know the x axis is one minus specificity the y axis is sensitivity so as you go away you can see that uh, you know the top part is 100% sensitivity and this far away is 100% one minus specificity so this is ulta that means this for the x axis zero is the best for the y axis this one is the best so the best cut off point is this near a you know so accuracy of the test is defined as area under the curve so this straight line which is the 45 degree line how far away and you know how much area from that uh, triangle that is covered is the best test or with the test with the most accuracy so this test a that you can see which has got a very good sensitivity very good specificity the triangle this is actually an ideal test which doesn't uh, exist but b c d if you consider then test b is the more accurate compared to c and d so this was a baby that was born with us at around you know 650 grams or baby girl and uh, she got discharged uneventfully and then uh, she came to me at 6 months with a limb length discrepancy i could notice that her one leg is little taller than the other so can you tell me the diagnosis and risk factors
Correct. So I think people have answered correctly. So as you can see on the right side, the acetabulum is not well formed and the femur head is small and it is outside the you know acetabulum. So this is a developmental dysplasia of the hip that was not picked up early on. Um, it was picked up much later. That's why the x-ray bones are looking long. Can you tell a few risk factors for this? Breach, breach is one, correct? Is it more common, DDH more common in boys or girls? Females, correct? And is it more common in the first born, second born, third born babies? Correct, first born. No? So first born, female, breach, oligodromios, these are the common risk factors for DDH. Again, very simple to screen. Ortolani, Barlo, usually at discharge, it should be done. Or at least at follow-up when the patient comes for vaccines, it can be done. Hmm? This is again a simple uh, picture. Tell me what is the finding and some risk factors for it, antenatal, postnatal. So this third picture is probably, you know, a more clear picture for many people who are not routinely doing scans. Yes, so it is a cystic PVL, periventricular leukomalacia. What are the antenatal uh, and postnatal risk factors for it? Correct. Prematurity remains the most important. Corioamnionite is very important. So the pathophysiology basically is hypoxia and inflammation. So whatever causes hypoxia, whatever causes inflammation, anything related to ventilation that can increase your PVL risk. When you put your baby on the ventilator, HFO, PSE, whatever modes, anything that can cause problem. So from the respiratory standpoint, the important factor for controlling your cerebral blood flow is your CO2. So I think somebody has answered low CO2. So hypocarbia is a big risk factor for PVL. So avoid hypocarbia, especially prolonged hypocarbia. Hmm? Good. Coming to the next question. So can you name the test and what is this person doing and some causes for abnormal examination? Red reflex, how far away from the baby you have to stand? One meter, um, can somebody say how much? Um, and also tell me some reasons for abnormal red reflex that is easier. So the distance, I think somebody has typed correctly. So 18 inches or 45 centimeters. So that is the ideal distance. Uh, an abnormal examination or abnormal red reflex will be seen where? I can see cataract, cataract, cataract. So red reflex happens from where? Where is the light reflecting back from? Is it is it reflecting back from the lens, cornea or retina? Yes, somebody has written retina. So the light is basically passing all the way to the retina. No? So anything that is causing a problem in that full path can cause an abnormal red reflex. So corneal, you know, uh, corneal clouding can cause an abnormal red reflex. In the lens, cataract can cause in the vitreous, vitreous hemorrhages can cause, retinoblastoma can cause. So anything that is a problem in this full pathway of the light going back and getting reflected can cause an abnormal uh, red reflex, which is called as leukoporia or a white reflex. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So coming to the ninth question, uh, can somebody name this test? Advantage and what abnormality is seen in this test? Amplitude. So the test people have said, so this is called a cerebral function monitor or amplitude EEG. Can somebody tell me the advantages of this test? Just type in the type in the box. Don't speak because a lot of um, echo is happening.
So advantage is what? So little bit about prognosis. Anything else? So it is a continuous test, no? So it can pick up subclinical seizures. So that is an advantage. Initially, it used it used to be used as a criteria for starting hypothermia. So that was an advantage. Hmm? So what is this particular amplitude EEG showing? You can see a dark line here, no? You can see a dark line and some light lines which are tall. And you can see that the dark line is below 5, 5 millivolts or microvolts. Sorry. So it is bottom part is below 5 microvolts. Upper part is also below 5 microvolts. Can you see? This is also below 5 microvolts. And in between you can see these big ones. So this is definitely an abnormal uh, amplitude EEG. But can somebody tell me what abnormality this is? This is a burst suppression with frequent bursts. So you can, what you see this, you know, spikes are actually a lot of bursts happening and the background is very much suppressed. So the background, uh, lower limit, upper limit, as you can see with the dark lines are all below five. And in between that you can see. So this is a burst suppression pattern with frequent bursts that are seen. So this is again the last question, again a simple question. What is uh, happening if the this loop shifts from dotted line to the blue line? Can somebody tell me what is happening? So dotted line is like here, no? And from here, if my curve is going down, what is happening? So a lot of uh, people have interesting answers, no? So some people are saying increase compliance, decrease compliance, change in pressure. Also, somebody can type in the formula for compliance. Somebody type the formula for compliance. Correct. So somebody has said. So basically the formula for compliance is change in volume per unit change in pressure. So if with little change in pressure, you get good change in volume means the compliance is good. So here, as you can see, you know, the dotted line, the volume is going up, up, up faster. So that dotted line is actually a better compliant lung than the blue line here, blue line with the same pressure the volumes are lesser with the blue line. Here, the volumes are higher with the same pressure. So if I consider this point with the blue line, volume is, you know, here. Whereas with the dotted line, the volume is all the way to the top. So shift from dotted line to blue line actually means that the compliance has gone poor due to whatever reason, either infection, fluid, whatever in the lungs. And the formula for compliance, I think people have correctly written. Delta V, that is change in volume divided by delta P for unit change in pressure. So I think that is all uh, that I have for the OSCEs and we are also short, I mean, reached our time limit. Yeah, thank you, Anish. Uh, excellent uh, MCQs and uh, we have had a uh, two hours of uh, nice case presentations, interactive. I'm <clears throat> sure this will help our uh, students to get better and better in their exams. So, so on behalf of the IAP NeoChap, <clears throat> Uh, take this opportunity to thank both Dr. Ashish Mehta and Dr. Anish and all the students who have uh, par participated here. I'm sure we learned quite a lot from this interactive session. So thank you one and all. Thank you. And, uh, thank good you.